Alright, hi everyone. Welcome to this online video on the chapter of covalent bonding. So, um, as mentioned in the earlier part when we introduced you to ionic bonding, in total there's three types of bonding in our syllabus. Ionic is one, covalent is the other one, and the last one is usually metallic. So you have noticed that in this front page you will see this thing about sharing of electrons, and that will be the main idea throughout this whole video. But before I proceed further, I just thought that I want to take some time to acknowledge and also to affirm these students who have given their questions when they did the ionic bonding part, which I thought were very, very good questions that will lead us into this lesson today on covalent bonding. So from Terence, uh, his question is on when do we do ionic bonding and when is it covalent bonding. So this will actually be addressed within um, this video itself, right? So that you know when do we think about ionic bonding and when do we think about covalent bonding. From Joey, regarding her question about can all elements react with one another? Now, this is not always the case, so just to um, address this bit. Now, all noble gases, so noble gases, if you look at the periodic table, these are actually our group 18, right? So this is the last column of elements. All noble gases are what we call inert and stable chemicals. So in this sense, they will not react with any other chemical, right? At least within our syllabus, uh, this group of elements, they will not react with other elements. But beyond that, all the other elements that we have learned in the prior table, right? They actually do not have this stable electronic configuration and therefore, if given an opportunity to react with another chemical, yes, they will actually react with other chemicals, right? So besides normal gases, we can take it that the other elements have a tendency to react. So in this sort of question regarding uh, metals as cross. So I think this, her question is more of in terms of the electrons, right? Do we use dots only for uh, non-metals and do we use cross only for metals, right? There's actually no um, restriction in terms of when you can use which one, right? So instead of looking at whether you should use cross or use dots, the I think the key idea is that you should always use different symbols, right? Because only when you use different symbols, that means a cross and a dot, then you can differentiate between one element for another. So later on when we talk about covalent bonding, you see that happening again. We'll be using cross or dots, depending on how many elements are there. And last but not least, in terms of Alfred's question, what do we do now if let's say an element has 2.8.6 in terms of the electronic structure and there's another one with 2.8.4? Is it still a compound? And if so, how do we even draw these electronic configurations? Like what I mentioned, all these questions are very, very good questions and it actually shows that you're thinking about the issues with just ionic bonding, right? Because ionic bonding it's always a very nice scenario whereby something can lose, something can gain electrons. But now you are thinking about situations whereby it's not so clear cut. And to answer Albert's question, this is when we will start to consider this thing called covalent bonding already. Right? When it is quite obvious that you can no longer just think about losing or gaining, then that's where this concept of sharing will come in. Right? So good job to these uh, students who have uh, indicated these questions. I think, I think just keep the questions coming along. Keep thinking about all these things and it will definitely help you along the way. Alright, so coming back to this uh, focus of this video, right? So in the previous lesson, we learned about ionic bonding and more specifically, we learned about the physical properties, right? About high melting point and boiling point that is for ionic compounds. We learned that they are soluble in water, but insoluble in organic solvents. We also learned that they can conduct electricity but more specifically, they only can conduct electricity in the molten or the aqueous states, right? So these are some of the things that we have learned about ionic compounds, right? So three over there. Okay, so the worksheets that you have done the corrections for, she have already uh, gone through some of these uh, concepts as well. But to start this video, or rather this part on covalent bonding, just take a while um, to go through these two pop quiz by yourself, right? You can pause the video. Um, to think about what are some of these questions and how do you address the response, right? So I'm just going to give a few um, tips, right? Then I will need you to do this by yourself, right? You won't be covered in this video, but when we meet again, uh, I want to talk about these two pop quizzes, okay? So first one is regarding aluminum, Al, and fluorine, F, with the respective uh, electronic configuration. So when you look at the electronic configuration, we can think about what can we do to make it stable, right? So we must remember that at the end of the day, we want to become a stable electronic configuration. And what we have here is not stable. So just a quick recap, you recall that in the ionic bonding chapter, 
we mentioned that if you have a metallic element, a metal, and a non-metal element, when they come together and they do a reaction, that's when you can form an ionic compound, right? So, how do you know whether is it metal and non-metal? You have to refer to your periodic table. Lah. Okay, so what can you deduce from here? This is likely going to be an ionic compound. So, if it's ionic bonding, that means we are speaking of ions, right? When we think about ions, we should ask ourselves, how can this aluminium, which is 2,8,3, become stable? <coughs> what should we do, right? Should we gain 8? Is it gain 5 or should it lose 3? And if it does so, what will happen? Likewise, over here, for this fluorine, it's 2,7. Right? If it's about ionic bonding, it must form an ion. Should we lose 7 or should we gain 1? So these are questions that we always ask ourselves, right? Then, from there, we can start to derive what would the structure look like. Okay? So try to draw this out by yourself, right? And uh, do take note that whatever you draw, you need to make sure that overall the charge is 0. So it must be balanced up. Right. And I think we addressed in class before that we always draw by alternating the positive charges with the negative charges, so on and so forth. Right? If you have a lot of ions to draw, you must make sure that you are always um, going a positive followed by negative followed by positive. Okay, so just try this out by yourself. The second pop quiz question is asking about now why are ion compounds not used to make perfumes? Okay, questions like these are very common, right? Especially in the pure chem syllabus getting students to think a bit more than just uh, memorizing what are some of the properties. So in order to address this question, right, you need to first understand what is important for a perfume um, in terms of the chemicals to make a perfume for it to actually work. So just give you some pointers over here, then you can try to uh, explain this based on your best understanding. Now, perfumes are usually made of what we call um, volatile liquids, right? So, what do volatile actually means? This term volatile actually means something that has a low boiling point, right? In other words, turns into gas very easily. So, I give you an example of what is uh, a common volatile liquid. One example would be ethanol or we can use a more generic term that say alcohol, right? So if you have used alcohol swap before, the one that you put on your hand before you go for your, say your COVID vaccination, right? You realize that once they wipe on your arm, right? The alcohol will actually evaporate very quickly, right? When it evaporates very quickly, you feel a cooling effect. Now that is what we call a volatile liquid, a liquid that can actually boil very fast as well at very low temperature in the sense that it will just evaporate you tend to gas very very easily right so that is a property that we want for perfume because when you spray it out right you don't want the liquid to stain your clothes right in fact your clothes will become wet right so you have to spray so that whatever that is um sprayed onto the clothes can also vaporize or become gas very easily but the smell will stay behind right so that is something that we need to know when you're thinking about a perfume now to address this question you need to ask yourself about what is the issue with ionic compound that doesn't allow this to happen. So, go through your previous notes on ionic compound and think through what usual boiling point for ionic compound, right? What exactly is so unique about ionic compounds in terms of their boiling point? And how would that link us back to this question on why we actually cannot use ionic compound to uh, make the perfume, right? So, to guide you in terms of your answer, right? How much do you write? How how do you explain this? This whole question itself is a three marks question. Right? This shows you that you cannot just tell me things that is like one line or two line, right? Uh, in fact, this answer here there's almost about four or five lines that you need to talk about. Right? Going to think through how you want to answer this using the notes from Alnick Compound. Right? The previous question here, the question is two marks. Right? Similarly, think through what do you need to show in order to um score for the photo marks of what an ionic bonding drawing should look like okay so with that we will go back to the uh, video focusing on covalent bonding sorry that I took a while to talk about the pop quiz huh? so for this video itself i'm just going to focus on how can we draw covalent bond and especially about this thing called arrangement of electrons which is essentially a dot and cross diagram right so these are the two key learning objectives first 
how do we even form covalent bond? Second is how do we draw? So understanding that there is an idea about sharing. And secondly is understanding how do you then draw to show that sharing is happening, right? So that is the focus of this uh, video. Okay. Before that, let's take a look at an analogy to try to understand what the whole concept of sharing means. Okay, let's take a look at this analogy to see if um, it can help us better understand what exactly is ionic bonding and how does it differ from covalent bonding, right? Which is the focus of this video. So let's imagine you, yourself, right? And you are a person that actually really, really loves bubble tea, right? And you are heading to buy playmate bubble tea after um, a long day of lesson, right? Uh, you left school, you went to Tampines 1, you had to buy playmate, but you realize that you don't have money. Okay, now there is two possible things that can happen at that moment. Like, imagine that you have a friend with you. Okay, so imagine that you want to borrow money, right? And you ask your friend to pass you, hey, can you pass me $2 to buy the Playmate bubble tea? Now you have the money, your friend don't have the money, and then you can buy your Playmate, right? And that is scenario one. Okay, so you took the money from your friend, you bought the bubble tea, and everyone's happy. Or rather, you are happy, right? Alternatively, what you can do is that you can actually share the money with your friend, right? That means both of you chip in $2 together and you will get a bubble tea, just one cup, but you share the bubble tea together and at the end, you and your friend both can enjoy the bubble tea. Okay, so what is the link about this thing? And is Mr. Singh going to buy bubble tea for everyone from 3-6? Uh, if you do well for a WA2, yes, we can have that as a party. Okay, but what I'm trying to show you here is this idea of an analogy to help you understand that on the left-hand side, it's actually something like ionic bonding, right? So now instead of thinking about you, right, wanting to buy bubble tea, let's think about an atom. An atom actually wants to achieve what we call a stable noble gas configuration or a stable electronic configuration, right? You want to achieve that stability. How can you do that? On the left-hand side, maybe it can gain or lose electrons, right? If there's someone that's willing to pass it the electron, there's someone that is willing to take the electrons, then that can happen. In that process, ions are formed. Right, so you have your anions or your cations depending on whether you gain or lose electrons, and then they are both now stable. Right, so they achieve what they wanted at the start, just like you want the bubble tea, but in the process, someone must lose and gain because you are borrowing money from your friend, and then you achieve that stable electronic structure. That is the whole concept of how ionic bond works. On the right hand side, what you actually have here is about the concept of sharing, right? And this concept of sharing is similar to how covalent bonding works whereby you now you share electrons instead of gaining or losing of electrons. In the process, you form covalent bond with another atom. And then, similarly, the outcome is that you still achieve that stable noble gas configuration. Just that now, when you form covalent bond with another atom, there's this new term that now we call a molecule. But then that, at the end of the day, you realize that both will achieve the similar outcome, right? So it's really a matter of whether it's about gaining or losing of electrons and whether it's about sharing of electrons. And this analogy is trying to help you understand that at the end of the day, all the atom wants to do right is to achieve the stable electron structure. But whether it does it through the ionic bonding on the left hand side or the covalent bonding on the right hand side really depends on who the atom is with. So you will realize in the next few slides, but I'm just going to introduce you at this point that in terms of ionic bonding, it must always be between a metal and a non-metal in terms of the elements. They must come together in this format. But in terms of covalent bonding, it must always be between a non-metal and a non-metal, right? You're going to realize why that is the case, okay? But that is what um, decides whether it should be ionic bonding or, co or covalent bonding. So actually, before we do any question, right, we must always ask ourselves, is it a non-metal with a metal or is it a non-metal with a non-metal before we start thinking about what should we draw? Okay, so as shown in the analogy, there's actually two types of bonding that we're looking at now. There's an ionic bonding and there's a covalent bonding. So coming back to the um, other slide, right? So what you have seen in the anal analogy just now, right, is that when there's a loss or gain of valence electron, that's where we form ions and that's where we understand this concept of ionic bonding. And when there's a sharing of valence electron, what actually forms, right, you are go to realize this in the next few slides is this thing called molecules and that's when we have this concept called covalent bonding right so um, how they were being drawn and what exactly are the particles will be quite different 
But I think the key idea to learn is that sharing is about covalent bonding and losing or gaining is about ionic bonding, right? And that should be able to guide you as you move along. So in terms of the elements that are involved, so maybe we can take a while to just look through this page itself and see for yourself what are the type of elements that are involved when we are looking at ion compounds when what are the types of elements that we are looking at when we are looking at covalent substances. So if you realize um, the heading that we are using here is quite um, unusual. Huh? Over here we say ion compounds, but I don't say covalent compounds. I use the word covalent substance. The reason is because for covalent chemicals, they can either be elements or they can also be compounds. Right? It'll take a while to understand what this means, but that's the reason why we use the word substances. We don't use the word compounds over here. So now that you're looking at the chemicals that are inside the ionic ones and the chemical that is inside the covalent ones, what do you see being the pattern, right? Of course, the color that's being shaded is different. But if you use the prior table and go and take a look at where, what all these pink color elements refers to and what all these blue color chemicals refers to in the prior table, you'll realize that for ionic compounds, it forms when a metal is with a non-metal. Right? And in fact, if you look at this whole set of um, color-coded things, right, the red ones are actually our metal uh, elements. And the blue ones over here are actually our non-metals in the prior table. Right? And then if you look at the covalent one, you realize that it is actually always just non-metal and non-metal. Right? So by knowing the element itself, it actually gives you an additional uh, information in terms of whether it's a ionic compound or a covalent substances. Right? So if you look closely at the name or in the future, the chemical formula of the chemicals, right? it actually can guide you in terms of what you should draw. Right? And using that, that's where it's a lot easier to know how do we differentiate between ionic and covalent substances. Okay, so with that in mind, let's take a look now at really how do we start drawing the sharing of electrons when you talk about covalent bond, etc. So as mentioned, covalent bond happens when non-metals and non-metals react together and they react together by the sharing of their valence electrons. Right, so actually all chemical reactions involves valence electrons, same for ionic, same for covalent, right? But in this case, it's more about the sharing itself, right? And this bond that's being formed is what we call a covalent bond. So in this part of the chapter, you start seeing structures that looks like this. Okay, this is still called dot and cross. Nothing has changed from what you know about dot and cross, okay? But um, something that's a bit different is that now you start to see that there's actually a space whereby the two electron shell will actually overlap, right? No longer do you see the bracket, the charge, right? And now you see that there's some overlapping of the circles. That is the concept of sharing, right? When we talk about sharing, what we want to see is that the electrons are actually shared between two particular atoms, right? And that is what we call a bond, right? And this itself is what we call a covalent bond, okay? So in the ionic chapter, whatever that we've been drawing is also known as a formula unit. But in the covalent chapter, we will not use this term, formula unit, we'll just say dot and cross, right? I think Generally, just remember it's dot and cross diagram whenever you are required to draw the compounds or whatever chemicals that is given to you. Okay, so how do we then go about drawing this? How did this uh, drawing actually arise, right? We need to slowly understand what is happening at each point, right? So first and foremost, we must always remember that uh, whatever we are drawing, right, the atom must be holding the same number of its original valence electrons, which means that there is no loss and there's also no gain of electrons. Remember this about covalent bonding. So don't accidentally add in one new electron or accidentally take out one electron, right? That is ionic bonding, different. Huh? Next, similarly, all elements, right, when they react, what they want to achieve is to get a stable electronic configuration, right? They want to be stable and how to become stable, you can either be looking at eight electrons or can either be looking at two electrons. We'll take a look at it together using the examples in the next few slides so you can see what it means, right? And last but not least, don't forget like the question that was being asked by our friends at the start of the video. We always use different symbols to represent the electrons, 
Okay, so it's not so much about who should use cross, who should use dot. We will use different symbols to show that there are different electrons coming from different atoms. If you have different elements, same thing, we use different uh, different symbols. Okay, let's see what this means, how this plays out over the next few slides, so not to worry too much, and hopefully you get a better idea of what it means when copper bonds form. Okay, so over here, right, similar example as what you saw just now, what you can see is that there is sharing of valence electron, there's a formation of a covalent bond, right, and when this thing happens, um, this new structure that you're looking at now is what we call molecule. Okay, so we will look at three sets of examples and try to understand how did the structure come about. So in the next few slides, you'll realize that I'll be showing you how to draw the structure and I'll also be introducing you to this thing called a structural formula, right? which I'll explain a bit more in the next few slides. Let's start first with chlorine. Right? Chlorine has an electron configuration of 2,8,7. If you use a periodic table, you should be able to get this information out quite easily because it has a proton number of 17. Okay? That is a chlorine atom. Now, when you look at this structure, we know that chlorine is not stable and it wants to become stable. Right? But if there isn't another element that can say that I can give you one more electron, like let's say you gain one electron, if this doesn't happen, that means there's nothing to give you that one electron, right? Then this chlorine has to depend on itself to become stable. And how does it do that? I'm going to draw the structure of chlorine using just um, outer shell electrons only. That means I'm not going to draw all the 287. So how will chlorine as an atom look like? It will just look like Cl with uh, this the outer shell electron uh, with the 7 drawn in this north, south, east, west format. This will be how chlorine looks like, which I think all of you should be able to figure this out. But we know that when we look at this, we know that this chlorine is not really stable, right? Because it's missing one electron that needs to be here, right? But like I said, it can only share. So who can he share with? That's when we actually introduce another chlorine atom. And this time, this time around, I realize that I'm using dots instead of crosses. Why do I use a different symbol? Because I want to differentiate the two atoms, right? If I use the same cross, I won't be able to tell them apart. So what exactly happens between these two chlorine? Purple one needs one, green one needs one, but both of them cannot lose electron, right? They have to find a way, just like when you buy the Playmate bubble tea, right? Let's come together to share, to share the electron that we have and make sure that um, the thing can overlap nicely. So what you end up with in this format, right, is that now the purple chlorine we actually want to share with the green chlorine and they share by overlapping their electron shell, right? And in this case, the outer shell electron. What happens now is the initial electrons that was there, so I'm going to use a yellow highlighter to highlight the original, the OG electrons uh, on the purple chlorine. We still stay there. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six. But the one that, um, let me change the highlighter, the one that's in green now, that one cross that's in green now, is actually now present inside the shaded region of the molecule, the overlap. Same thing for the green chlorine, right? So originally there's all these electrons here, I just used the pink highlighter, and they will still appear over here. So I still have my six dots over here. But this particular single dot here, which is in brown now, will actually appear inside this overlap area and shaded in brown. Right. So what exactly happened in this reaction was the green cross and the brown dot actually came together to overlap. And that's how you form <coughs> a molecule. And that's how actually chlorine comes about. That's why for chlorine, right, you'll learn that actually the formula for chlorine Right, how they exist as in terms of a chemical is actually existing as this thing called Cl2. Right, same thing, you have learned that things like things called O2, H2, so on, N2, etc. Right? Later you'll see for yourself how we actually realize that is a formula because they have to bond in this manner in order to be stable. You can't have chlorine staying like this by itself because it would not be stable. And when this thing hold, hold, this whole thing happens, you form a molecule. And because within it, there's a pair that means two electrons here 
right, that's being shared together, we call this a single covalent bond, right? If you have more than one pair, then you will call it accordingly. And how do we show this structure in terms of this thing called structure formula? We'll draw chlorine as a Cl. Then there's another chlorine, a green one, which is a Cl. But because in between them, there is now a bond, right? And it's called a single covalent bond. We actually use one stroke, a dash to represent what's going on, right? So in other words, this stroke represents my single covalent bond, okay? So hope it's not too confusing. We'll try this out for the next two slides to look at another two examples. Okay, if you have already figured out how, how this works, right, you might want to pause the video and you can try to draw it out for yourself for the next two slides. And you can take a look at it again. Okay, the next one is for oxygen, right? So using a periodic table, you can figure out that oxygen has an electronic configuration of 2,6 because it has 8 proton, right? So now let's try to get to draw out how oxygen actually looks like. But before that, I think you already know that oxygen actually has this formula called O2, right? So now you can see where did we actually derive this O2. How come it's two oxygen atoms? Let's draw one oxygen atom now first, using just the outer shell electrons only. So oxygen is the element of O. Outer shell meaning to say that I only draw the one that has the six electrons. So this time around, I'm going to use cross to start off first. So my north, south, east, west, followed by my north, south. This is the reason why it's important to make sure that we are very clear of how do we draw the electrons because by drawing in this way, I will know that I have these two electrons here. They are kind of odd. They are not being partnered with any other electrons. Okay, so that's one of the oxygen. So from this, we can tell that the oxygen actually needs two valence electrons. But remember, it can't gain, it can't lose because we didn't give it any of the other elements to react with. So all it has is actually perhaps just another of itself. Right, so an oxygen now. So because I started with cross, this time around I'm going to use dots to represent these oxygen's electrons. Similarly, it will be a 2,6 and therefore it has 6 electrons over here. And these two electrons here are kind of like the odd ball. It, uh, they are not paired up, so they would also require two valence electrons in order to become a stable electron structure. Okay, so this would apply to similar concept as what we learned just now in terms of the chlorine. Now, when you have these two elements coming together, let's look at how the dot and cross diagram and covalent bond happens. What actually happens is that you have the oxygen atom, the purple one, now actually overlapping with the green oxygen atom. And when they overlap, the focus is actually on these electrons that I highlight. Why? Because they are the lonely electrons, they don't have a partner. As compared to this electron, as compared to this electron, as compared to this electron, as compared to this electron. So our job is actually to pair them up, right? That means when I want to draw this structure here, I will be very certain that my green oxygen will already have these four electrons remaining where they are because I'm not going to touch them. Likewise, my purple electron uh, oxygen will also have these four crosses where they are. And I'm also not going to touch them because that was where they belong already. Now, what will happen is that these single electrons will come together to fill up this overlapping area. And when they come together, it's interesting because you'll realize that it will now be a cross paired with a dot followed by a cross paired with a dot. So some students will ask, can I don't draw alternate cross dot cross dot? Can I just draw cross cross dot dot? Thing to take note that the shared electron must alternate because they are being shared, right? So no one is actually holding on to the cross, no one is actually holding on to the dot. And in order to show that it's distributed nicely, we always alternate them. So that's the first common question that students will ask. Secondly, some students might ask, can I draw dot cross dot cross? Yes, you can do that, right? So long as it's alternating. Okay, so it doesn't matter whether you cross dot cross dot or dot cross dot cross, right? But you can't do something like um, cross dot dot cross, right? Then it's not alternating or like dot cross cross dot or even worse dot dot cross cross like what I mentioned. These are all not acceptable. Okay, so we always show it in this manner in order to show how the electrons are being shared across the two atoms evenly, fairly. Okay, so when this happens, you realize that now there's actually two pairs of electrons that are being shared. So you see four electrons in the middle area. Right, and this is now what we call a 
double covalent bond. Just now you learned about single covalent bond, right? This is actually what I call double covalent bond because there's four pairs of electrons. Sorry, there's two pairs of electrons, which means that there's four electrons being shared. How do we draw the structure formula? We'll write the oxygen symbol, the other oxygen symbol as well. But this time around, because there's a double covalent bond, you will see a double stroke. So what does this double stroke mean? This double stroke means a double covalent bond. So at the end of the day, what we are trying to tell you is that you can draw this, which is called a dot and cross diagram, right? But when the structure becomes so complicated, sometimes you can't draw so many of the rings together. That's why we introduced this thing called structure formula, right? Uh, you won't really need to draw this structure formula until towards the end of sec 4, right? But for now, it's good to know what they actually represent. All this double line, single line, and later you'll see a triple line, right? So this is how oxygen actually looks like. And then you'll realize that that's how we actually derive the idea of O2, okay? Because of how we look at the electrons being coming together and we'll take a look at the next example now the next one is for nitrogen nitrogen using a pure table we can figure out that the electron configuration is 2 comma 5 right and if we were to draw our nitrogen by itself we will draw an n similarly let's say we just draw the outer shell electron only okay because we don't draw everything okay so if you draw the outer shell electron only there is 5 so you have north south east west and another north okay now nitrogen by itself we know that it is not stable right what it needs to have it needs three it needs three valence electron okay but it can't gain it can't lose because there's no other elements there to help it with that but it can have another of itself right because there's always so many different atoms out there right so if you have a nitrogen atom you can have another nitrogen atom that next to it and what will happen is this other nitrogen atom in order to differentiate the electrons i'm going to use a cross now right if i can, cannot tell them apart so looking at these two structures again both of them actually need three to become stable right and interestingly when you look at that structure you realize that actually both of them also have these three electrons that they can share with the other fella Right, so this time around, I'm not going to shit everything. I'm just going to focus on these few electrons. They're actually what we call lonely electrons, right? Because they are, they are actually able to um, be used for the bonding. The other two electrons here and here, they actually already have a partner. So we don't touch these electrons here. We focus on these individual electrons and how we can bring them together. So the drawing now, when we bring the electrons together, we have our purple nitrogen here. We have our green nitrogen here. Making sure that the overlap is big so that there's space to draw everything. Okay, similarly, let's put back the electrons that were not used up for the when we won't be using. So you have my two cross of my nitrogen staying here, my two dots of my nitrogen staying here. Then that's when I need to put in all these other electrons. Right? So how do I put in these electrons? I need to alternate them, right? So I alternate them by making sure that I have a dot first, followed by a cross. Followed by a dot, followed by a cross, followed by a dot, and followed by a cross. Right? And in doing so, I will have already paired up all the electrons that um, were previously lonely by themselves. Right? And now I've already put them all together in the whole structure. And when I look at my structure now, remember we, do, uh, we need to do a checking, right? How do we check? So what we can do is we will just focus on just focus on my blue highlighted um, nitrogen over here. So I'm just gonna highlight the whole nitrogen and count for yourself if this nitrogen has already achieved what is considered stable. So there's one, two, there's three, four, five, six, seven, eight over here. So this nitrogen is indeed stable. So we have achieved that stable electronic structure that we want. Similarly, maybe now we can look at my pink circle. Okay, look at this nitrogen now and we do a counting again it has one two three four five six seven eight so it does have that eight electron that you wanted and therefore it is also stable and with that that's how we derive that actually nitrogen as a chemical this formula is actually n2 okay and in this case because i have a total of three pairs of electron that means i have six electrons being bonded together this will then therefore be called a triple covalent bond Right, and there's a structure formula. I think you can deduce now that it will look 
like this because there's actually a triple covalent bond here. Okay, so hopefully it's not too confusing at this point, but I just need to take note that at this point we are still drawing just elements, right? We're not really going into like what if you have different elements coming together. Now it's all very nice, nitrogen and nitrogen, chlorine and chlorine, oxygen and oxygen, right? So we need to think of what will happen if there's more than one type of elements. And that's something we'll try out over the next few worksheets. So in summary, what we have actually discussed just now was by knowing the valence electrons, we can actually derive how the bonding could actually take place. So just to summarize what you have seen just now, um, and also to help you um, think about the importance of valence electron shell, right? So over here, we have an example of hydrogen, and also have these examples of chlorine. And uh, you see this term over here called halogen, okay, not to be too worried about it. Halogen basically refers to our group 17 elements, right? So you also have fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, so and so forth. Right? So there's a lot of various ones. So when you look at their structure, you realize that they will all have seven valence electrons in this case. And once you have that, you know that to be stable, it needs one valence electron. And whenever we are thinking about um, covalent bonding, when you need one, means you will share one, right? And therefore, you will see all this bond that looks like this, a single stroke, single stroke, single stroke, single stroke, and single stroke, right? Because that ref uh, refers to a single covalent bond, whereby I share one and you share one. When you have structure like this, that's the oxygen. This time when you look at oxygen, you realize that in terms of the lonely electrons, there is these two, same for sulfur, there is these two, right? So how can they be stable? We will ask ourselves, how can we help them achieve stability by sharing? So this oxygen, we know that it needs two valence electrons to be stable. Same for the sulfur, it needs two valence electrons to be stable. But what's interesting is that in order to get a two valence electron, either I can form if you look at the oxygen one, I can form two sets of single bond. So you see there's two strokes sticking out, or I can form one set of a double bond. Same for sulfur, one set of a double bond, or I can form two sets of a single bond. Right. So what you can see is that by understanding what is the valence electron shell, uh, how many electrons there are, I can actually think about hey, how many bonds can this structure actually form. Okay. So that's just something for you to think about as you go along. Next, we have nitrogen over here. So nitrogen and phosphorus actually. So for nitrogen, same thing. There's three lonely guys here. Lonely electrons. For phosphorus, there's these three lonely electrons. So for both of them, what you realize is that both of them need three valence electrons to be stable. Okay, we are talking about sharing. So in this case, we don't need, we don't need to think about, oh, can I put in crosses? That will be ionic bonding, but we're focusing on sharing for this particular um, part of the lesson, right? So if you need three valence electron, means that you must be willing to share, okay? And sharing could mean maybe you have three sets of single bond, then you will share the three electrons out, or maybe you can have one single bond and a double bond. That also achieve that three valence electron sharing that you want, or you can just go for a triple bond right so that's actually what can happen when you look at um, a structure like nitrogen and uh, phosphorus which means that in total they can form three covalent bonds but it doesn't matter it could be a combination of three single it can be one single one double or it can be one triple all three scenarios can give you three covalent bonds Right? And for the last one, we have carbon over here. When you look at carbon, you know that it has four valence electron. That means it needs four to become stable. Right? And in order to do that, it can either form maybe four sets of single bond. Maybe it can also form two sets of double bond. Or perhaps it can form one set of single and one set of triple bond as shown in the drawing on the left hand side. Right, so these are some of the things that you will think about when you're looking when you're looking at a chemical. 
and trying to deduce how the dot and cross diagram will look like. Right. The next few worksheets will give you a better chance to practice this concept. Right. So in summary, what have we learned? We have learned that non-metals and non-metals they will actually react by sharing valence electron, and that's how we form a covalent bond. Right. And they do that because at the end of the day, just like what we have learned in ionic bonding, every um, atom wants this thing called a stable electronic configuration. Right. They want to reach this stability. If not, they will just keep reacting. Right. So that's what we have covered so far. So just a quick check on the learning objectives. We'll talk about how do we actually form by sharing and we also learn about how do we draw. But of course, the drawing, right, we only look at the very, very straightforward drawing. Uh, we have to try this out over the next few worksheets. And in the worksheets, you realize that some of the drawing is really not easy. So if you are stuck, um, please feel free to watch the remaining Google Classroom videos. It will guide you on a step-by-step -step basis on how do you go about drawing the dot cross diagrams. Right? If not, that's all for this part of covalent bonding. Thank you.